So I thought of some more analysis that I'd like to do with our orders. Instead of just identifying the pending and completed, what if we divided them into two groups? Hmm, that's a good idea. Now we could probably do that with a combination of select and each, but that really is the long way around the barn because the enumerable module gives us some higher level methods for doing this and other tasks like it. So let's have a look at that. So you said you wanted to divide the orders, and the method for doing that is actually called partition in the enumerable module. It takes a block, it's gonna give us all the orders as we would expect here, and we wanna partition them based on their status. So we're gonna say the status is equal to pending. And let's just see what that returns to us. I'm gonna assign this to a variable called results, and then I'm gonna use the p method and pass it that array, and the p method, different than the put s method here, is just gonna show us the internal representation of that array. So we're gonna see the array in its rawest form, all right? So when we run this, here's the output that we're getting, right here. And we see that we get an array, but inside of that array are actually two subarrays. Here's the first subarray. Notice that it has the orders that have a status of pending, so it's the orders that match the criteria in our block, and then it has a second subarray right here, and it contains all the orders that aren't pending. Okay, so our results array here is actually an array of arrays, and there's an easy way to destructure this into two individual arrays in Ruby. We can do that simply by assigning to two different variables. So our first variable will be called our pending orders, and our second variable will be the completed orders. That's everything else. And because this method returns an array of arrays, and we have two variable names separated by a comma on the left-hand side, it'll go ahead and separate those two subarrays out into these two different variables. So then here we can just say, okay, here are our pending orders, put as pending orders, that's the name of the variable, and then here are our completed orders, just like that. If we run this, now we see, okay, here's the heading pending. We've got the two pending orders and completed the two completed orders. So we've got two separate arrays now, one containing pending orders, one containing completed orders. So that gave me an idea. We could do something similar for big orders and small orders. Sure, we'll just use partition again. I'll do this just from the beginning. We'll just go, we want a big orders array. We want a small orders array. We're gonna take our orders array here and partition it knowing that it's gonna give us two different things back here when we destructure that. O is gonna be the block parameter. In this case, we want the order total greater than or equal to 300. So for all the orders where this returns true, it's gonna be put in this array, and for all the other orders, they're gonna be put inside of this array. So we'll just print those out. These are big. And here are our small orders. Run that, and sure enough, it partitioned them just as we would expect, our big orders and our small orders. So here's another example of the partition method in action. Let's say we also track the country in which the order was placed. So the order class also has a country attribute, and we're interested in dividing the domestic and international orders into two separate arrays. The very clever partition method makes this really easy. The orders for which the block returns true, in this case the country is USA, end up in the first array, domestic. The orders for which the block returns false, any country not USA, end up in the second array, international. So I just got a note from marketing, and it says here that they want to get all the emails from our orders so they can email our customers and send them a newsletter. Oh, so we basically need to transform all of our orders that are in an array into an array of emails. So let's see how to do that. So let's start with a label here. These are gonna be our newsletter emails. And we wanna create a new array that contains the email. So I'm gonna have an empty array called emails right there. And then what we need to do is go through all the orders in the orders array and accumulate those emails into the email array. So we already know one way to do that would be to use our each method. We're gonna take our orders array, we can call each, give it a block, that's gonna give us an order. Then we can append to that emails array, I'm gonna do this all on one line, by taking the orders email, just like that. Oh, and we should downcase them. Sure, we can convert those to lowercase using the downcase method because email is just a string. 
So that takes all the orders, converts them into emails, and puts them in the emails array, and then we can just print out that array. And again, I'm gonna use P, which will give us the internal representation of that array using P emails. Print that out, and we've got our array of emails printed out nicely like that. Now this works, but there's a much better way to do this using the map method. We can actually get rid of this temporary variable that has our empty array called emails, and we can use the map method instead of each. All right? The map method is gonna take everything that's in the orders array in this case, and then we're gonna give it a block and tell it we want a new array containing only these elements or these attributes of an array. So rather than appending them to an array, we can just say, take the orders, and convert them into their downcased emails. Now the map method returns a new array. That array is just gonna contain our emails, which are gonna be strings, which we can print out that way. So if we run this, we get exactly the same thing. We've got our array of customer emails. So what happened was the map method here called the block for each element in the array, and then it placed whatever the block returned in the new array. In this case, the block is returning, this is the only expression in the block, so it's implicitly returning the value or the result of that expression, which will be the downcased email. So what we get back is an array containing all the values returned from calling the block. And then we just print them out. Now there's a gotcha with this, and it's the same gotcha we saw a little bit earlier, which is if inside of this block, you use put s to actually print out the email inside of the block, well, remember, put s is going to print out this email to the screen, but then put s itself returns nil. So what happens if we do this? Well, we get back an array of nil. Because put s returns nil, map just takes whatever's returned by the block, nil in this case, and puts it in the new array emails. So that's just something to watch out for. One important thing to note here is that our original orders array hasn't changed map hasn't changed it and we can print out our orders I'll just use P to do that our original orders array and we see that it still has all of our orders in there so let's recap we have an array of four order objects the map method calls the block for each order and places the blocks return value in a new array so when Mo's order is passed to the block the return value of the block is Mo's email downcased or a string that string is then mapped into the first position of the new array. The map method iterates through each successive order, mapping the order's downcased email to the corresponding position of the new array. Since we're calling map on an array of four orders, it returns an array of four emails. The returned array is always the same size as the original array. So the folks from the marketing department talked to people from the finance department and uh -oh. figured out what we can do. So now the finance department wants to know the taxes on the orders in Colorado. Okay, so what we need to do is filter all the Colorado orders out of our orders array. Right. And then we need a new array that just contains the tax for those orders. Right. Okay, well we can pull this off by stringing together a couple of the methods we've already used. So conveniently, we already have this tax method that computes the tax based on the total and the state of the order. So we don't have to worry about that part of the equation. Down here at the bottom then, we're just gonna print out our taxes. So the first part of this is just to get all the Colorado orders. I'm gonna assign that to an array called CO orders. We're gonna use orders. We wanna filter all the orders from Colorado. So we're gonna use the select method to do that. And our criteria is the order state equals Colorado. All right, that's step one. The next step then is to get the taxes for all the orders from Colorado. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our CO orders array and we're gonna map those orders to their tax. We just call the tax method to do this. The tax here is a method, it's not an actual attribute. So you'll often wanna use any uh, methods that derive values like a tax here inside of your blocks as criteria. You don't have to just check individual attributes. Actually, in this case, whatever the method returns will get mapped into that position of the array. And then we'll just print out our CO taxes array see what we get. And you see that we've got an array of two values, four and two, that match the two Colorado orders that we have. Now we can actually refactor a bit to do all of this on one line and chain together methods. And you'll often see Ruby code that does this, so it's good to sort of get used to it. What we can do is at the end of the select, remember select returns an array. 
So we can turn around and just call map on whatever is returned by select. And this is going to end up being our CO taxes. So we select all the orders from Colorado. That expression returns an array, which we then just turn around and call the map method on. The result of that is going to be an array of taxes, and we assign that to CO taxes. And that works just the same. So here's our last request. This one is from the sales department. Uh-oh. They want to know the total of all our orders. So we need to iterate through all the orders and just accumulate their total. Right. Okay. All right, we solved this before using code that looked something like this. We just had a sum variable, and then we used each to iterate through the orders and use the plus equal operator to accumulate the order total into sum, and then we just printed out total sales that way. But as you might imagine, there's an easier way to do this, and that's by using the reduce method. Now, reduce can be a little bit tricky, so let's jump over to a scratch pad and play around with some basic numbers. So here's an array of numbers, and let's say that we just want to sum up all of these numbers. The way we do that is by using the reduce method on that array. The reduce method takes a method parameter. In this case, it's going to be the initial value, which we're going to set as zero. And then it takes a block. Now, this method gives two block parameters. The first is going to be an accumulator value, or a variable in which we want to accumulate these numbers as we total them up. And the second block parameter is going to be the actual number. It's going to be the elements in the array. It's going to give us each of those number elements. Then the block itself is going to take the sum and it's going to add the number. Now notice we're not using plus equals here. We're just saying sum plus number. And the reduce method will take the result of this expression and each time through the iteration will assign it back to this sum. So it's just going to go through each of those numbers, running the block, and taking whatever the block returns and adding it to sum. So it'll take care of that for us. Now the return value of reduce is the value returned by the block the last time it was called. So we need to assign it to a variable or print it out. I'll just assign it to a variable called result here, and we'll just print out result. All right, what do we get back when we run it? Well, it's 10. It's the sum of all those numbers. So you can think of reduce as reducing a collection down to a single result by running the code in the block for successive elements in the array. Now you may see reduce called without a method parameter. It's an optional parameter, so you don't have to pass in a parameter there. If you don't pass in a parameter, then the initial value will be the first element in the array. In this case, it's going to be one. Now, for the first iteration of this array, all it did was take zero, which was our initial value, and added one. So this is gonna do the exact same thing for us. We run that, sure enough, we get 10. You may also see a shortcut used with reduce. There are a couple different shortcuts you can use. All right, one of them is you can just drop the block completely, and as a method parameter, you can pass in the name of a method or an operator to apply to each element. In this case, we wanna add them up. So we use a symbol, and then we say we wanna use the plus operator. That's just gonna run the plus operator against all the elements in the array, numbers in this case, and numbers in Ruby support plus. So we get the same value if we do that. And if you wanna set an initial value, say for example zero, you could say zero comma and then that plus operator. Or if you wanted to multiply all these things, you could actually pass in, for example, the multiply operator, which gives us 24. But that only works for objects that support things like times and plus. In this case, we have numbers in our array, so it works out just fine. So that's another shortcut you may see used with the reduce method. So we can apply this to summing up all our order totals. Sure. Instead of doing it the long way here, we take our orders. Instead of calling each, we'll call the reduce method. We need to pass in an initial value because remember, our orders array contains order objects. So it's not going to work if we don't pass in an initial value. It's going to try to use the first order in that array, and it doesn't know to use the orders total. So we're just going to tell it, start with zero. Then inside of the block, instead of using plus equals, we just use sum plus the order total. Remember, it's going to take that order total, and it's going to want to assign it back to something. That something it assigns it back to is the first block parameter. So we've got two block parameters, sum, which is an accumulator, and order, which is the elements in the array. Remember that reduce returns a value, so we need to assign this to a value. This is going to be our sum, and we print out the sum below, total sales of 1,000. 
Well, since we have a tax method, we could easily sum up all the tax amounts. Sure, it's a good practice here. Our total tax is what we're looking for. We're gonna take our orders array. We're gonna reduce it down. Two block parameters, remember, sum and order. Although you can call this whatever you want. We could call it total. And then inside of here, we use total plus order dot tax. And then we just print out total tax. If we run that, our total tax is $22. So once you start learning these enumerable modules, you often find multiple ways to do the same thing. Just as an example of that, there's a different way we could do this. I'm gonna comment out the first one just so you can see it. Instead of trying to reduce orders down to tax totals, we could do this another way. We could take our orders, we could map them to their tax. That's gonna give us an array of taxes. Array of taxes is just gonna be an array of numbers. So we could take that array of numbers and reduce it down using the shortcut because numbers support the plus operator, right? That should give us the same thing. We just did it a different way. And sure enough, our tax total is still $22. So here's the last recap. The reduce method takes an initial value, zero in this case, as the method parameter. The associated block then takes two block parameters. The first parameter is the accumulator, so we called it sum in this case. The second parameter is assigned successive elements in the array, which in this case are orders. So how does reduce work? The first time through the iteration, sum is assigned the initial value of zero, and order is assigned the first order object in the array. In the block, the value of sum and the order's total are then added together and returned from the block. This return value, 300 in this case, is then assigned to sum to start the second iteration. And we go through the same accumulation for the second object and all the other objects in the array. The final value returned by the block, 1,000 in this case, is then returned by the reduce method and total equals 1,000. There's a lot you can do with these three methods and in the exercise you're going to get a chance to practice with them with a variety of examples. Yeah, and in the next section we'll shift gears a bit and learn how to write our own methods that call blocks, which lets us write more expressive and compact code. See you then.